Good morning and welcome back to another lecture here for pre-calculus. Uh, in this lecture we're going to be talking about graphs of equations um, <clears throat> in the coordinate plane. Uh, just in R2, uh, not, on, uh, not in R3, not in three dimensions, not in five dimensions, not in anything other than just two. Uh, we've graphed things before on lines, so that's on just the real line. Today's lecture will look at graphing things when you've got two real lines to, to work with. Um, so things get a little bit more difficult, but it's it's still something that I think most people are familiar with from high school. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, so before I start plotting things and graphing things, I want to talk about uh, the coordinate plane. So if we take a real line, this is positive infinity and this is negative infinity, um, we can think about a location on this line by giving a number, a numerical value, like here's zero, it's the middle of this line, if you can call it such a thing. 10 is 10 things over here, negative two is right here, right? We've got these locations that correspond to a number on this real line. Now, what if we thought about two real lines? Right? And what if I said something like this? You know, instead of looking at just one number, let's look at two numbers and let's link them together. So maybe we'll think 10, negative 10 and, and ne negative 2 are linked together somehow. And uh, uh, we'll think of 0 and 0. We'll think of them as being linked together. And 1 and 10 being linked together. It's like picking any two random numbers, right? And we're just going to pair them together. Now, a nice way of representing this pairing of any two numbers from two lines is to plot them on a plane in a much less confusing way, I would say. But this is the general idea that you're taking two real number lines and you're linking numbers together in pairs. So this one here, this, this first link, we could think of as the pair negative 10, negative 2. We could think of this other pair as 0, 0. This one as 1, 10. I'm just listing the, the first number first, the second number second, right? So I'm just listing them. It's an, it's what we call an ordered pair. This first number comes from the first line, the second number comes from the second line. Okay. So let's, let's do one small thing. Let's change the way we drew this. Let's take one of those lines and we'll make it horizontal and we'll attach zero to zero so that the other line is now vertical. So we've got two of them now, right? And uh, we've just put one horizontally, one vertically. Now what we say is if we create a, a pairing, let's go with three, four, then let's make this the first line and this one the second line. Now what we can say is this number 1, 2, 3 is linked or paired with 1, 2, 3, 4. A nice way to represent that is to look at this point right here. Okay, this little dot that I've drawn. It is exactly 3 units over. Right, it's exactly, it's vertical, it's right over three. And it is exactly four units up. Right, if I drew a horizontal line, it's right there at the four. This is the way that usually we think of ordered pairs. If we look at this ordered pair, the first number describes how far left and right it is. The second number describes how high up or down it is. Let me give you 
give you another pair. How about we just work with um, something like this? Um, negative 2, 3. Let's go with another one, 1, 4. Let's go with another one, uh, 1, negative 2. So this first one I'll call A. It's 2 on the first number line, which is the horizontal. We call that the x-axis often. It's 2 to the left, negative 1, negative 2. And on the next axis, we often call that the y-axis. It's 3 up, 1, 2, 3. So this pairing corresponds to this point that I've just drawn here and labeled A. It is 2 to the left of the origin and 3 up. So 2 to the left and 3 up. Let's graph the next point, which I'll call B. It is one unit to the right of the origin, and it is four units up. One, two, three, four. So I'm gonna draw this point here, label it B, and we'll just you know recognize that this is over one, up four. So this coordinate pair this linking of these two numbers together, one from the x-axis, one from the y-axis, we're going to represent that with plotting a point there where we've done that, in that manner. The next one is 1, negative 2. So to the right, 1, and down, 2. I'll call that one C. Okay. So what we've got here is just ordered pairs. They're just a number from one number line com linked with another number from another number line and we usually plot them in this way where the first number is from the horizontal axis and it represents how far right or left we are from the origin and the second number which we usually call uh, the y coordinate the first one is the x coordinate the next one is the y coordinate it's how high up or how far down we are above or below the axis um, so these pairs, x, y, I've already used the words, these are what we call coordinates. Coordinates. We've got two numbers that are ordinates, so coordinated. Um, they tell you the, where, they, where you are on each number line. This is the x coordinate, this is the y coordinate. Whether there's a number there or a variable there, that's usually what we call them, the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. Um, and there are some really nice properties of these, of these things. If you just think about this plane that we had before, the surface, the plane. Um, over here, we call this the first quadrant. There's one, two, three, four quadrants, four parts to the plane here in the quadrant one, we notice that both of these things are positive. Both the x and the y coordinates are positive numbers. Here in quadrant two, the x coordinate is negative because we're to the left of the origin, which is this point. I, I haven't said that yet. That's the origin. It's where everything starts. It's where we linked the zero with the zero. Okay call that the origin. In quadrant two, x is negative, but y is positive. We're above the x-axis. Here in quadrant three, we have both are negative. Okay, We're to the left of the origin, and we're below the origin, so both of these things are negative. And lastly, quadrant four, we've got x is positive, but y is negative. So I'll color code these real quick. Quadrant one represents any point, any point over here. This is quadrant one. Okay, it's any point up here in, in sort of this, this rectangle, this square, if you will. 
quadrant two is any point over here in the top left. Any point in the top left. Okay, that's quadrant two. Quadrant three is any point, any ordered pair down here. Okay. Quadrant four is any point in the bottom right. Just to make this as explicit as possible, these are the four quadrants, color coded. Um, notice that the axes, I, I didn't color. Because any point that is on the axis isn't in one quadrant. It's either in two or it's in all four, if you will. <laughs> it's on the boundary of the quadrants. Any point or an ordered pair on the x-axis, that's this line here, the x-axis, has a zero y-coordinate. Right, that makes sense. If I pick a point here, it's a certain distance to the right, and how high up or down it is, is it? Well, it's not. So it's at a height of zero. So every x coordinate is something, but every y coordinate for points on the x axis is just zero. That's nice. A point on the y axis, a point on the y axis has a x coordinate has an x coordinate equal to zero. If I to illustrate that, just pick a point, any point on this vertical line. You know, there's some distance up for it, but how far left and right is it? It's not. So these look like this. A zero x coordinate and some distance up or down. Okay, just a couple easy facts right there. Um, so what if I, what if I wanted to give you two points <clears throat> and ask you how far apart they are? So this is point one, call it A. This is point two, call it B. A has some x and some y numbers associated with it, right? It's some distance left or right, x1, and some distance up or down, y1. B also has some coordinate, x2, y2, associated with it. Now, how far apart are these two? What is this distance? Well, I, I hope you can remember way back from high school geometry class that there's this thing that helps you calculate distances uh, when those things are triangles. There's this equation that helps you compute a distance on a triangle if you know two of those other parts of the triangles. It's the Pythagorean theorem. So we are going to try and and uh, do some some quick Pythagorean math here. I want us to try and find how long this is, and I want us to try and find how long this is. What are those lengths? And then how can we use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for d? So first, let's find this red distance. So you know zero is somewhere on this x-axis, you know, it's, let's say it's down here, here's 0 on the x-axis. This is x1, right, it's right there, and this is x2, just dropping it straight down. What is this distance here? Well, we learned a few sections ago that that distance, that length, is actually just the difference of those two with an absolute value around it. In this case, we know x2 is larger, so let's, just, let's write this down as x2 minus x1. We could, if we didn't know, do this. So if you don't remember that, go back in your notes. 
You studied that a few sections ago. Now we'll do the same thing on the y-axis. This first point is at a height of y1. The next point is at a height of y2. What is this length here? Just like before, it is y1 minus y2, rather, minus y1. We know that y1, perhaps, if 0 is down here, y2 is bigger than y1. If we didn't know, we would do that. Use absolute values to just give us the length of that blue line there. Now, the Pythagorean theorem says if you know two legs of a right triangle, you can compute the length of the hypotenuse using this. Right? It was a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. We've got ourselves a right triangle here. What are a, what are b? So a is just this. Absolute value of x2 minus x1 squared. At this point, I hope you can see now we don't need the absolute value because we're squaring it. So if it were negative, it would just become positive anyway. So that's a squared plus b squared. b squared is this other one, y2 minus y1. But again, we don't need those absolute values because we're going to be squaring this. If it were negative, we'd square it and we'd get rid of it, get rid of the negative sign. And this is the hypotenuse squared. Okay, now you all are budding algebraists, so you know how to solve this sort of thing for d. It's squared right now. To undo that, we're just going to square root it. So we take the square root of both sides, and we've got it. Now there should be a plus or minus here, but it's understood that we're working with the length of a line. We're working with a distance, and a distance cannot be negative. If we made this into a displacement, we could make it a vector, right, and include a negative sign, you know, go, go this way instead of going the other way, for example, but we're working with just the, the length here, the distance, not the displacement. So this is what you call the distance formula. The distance between any two points. x1, y1, and x2, y2, doesn't matter what they are, is d. This is kind of a cool little thing. You know the locations of any two things, you can always find the straight line distance between them using just that formula there. Okay. Another question that might be related is, how do you find the midpoint of this line? So we've got x1, y1, and x2, y2. These are our points from before. How do you find, and maybe I'll locate it here, the exact coordinates of this midpoint? It's the point that cuts this line exactly in half. So both halves are exactly the same length. What's well, actually not too bad of a process. You see, before we drew this horizontal line below, and we drew this vertical line to the right, the basic idea is that we're just going to take both of these and find their midpoints. And then the midpoint of that line is going to be exactly at the coordinates of both those values. So now what we need to try and determine is how do we find exactly the middle of the endpoints of a vertical line and of a horizontal line. So I'll let you think about that for exactly two seconds. There we go. The basic idea here is that you're going to find the average of the heights and the average of the widths. So you're going to find the average y value, which is exactly 
y2 plus y1 over 2. And you're going to find the average of the x's. That's x1 plus x2 over 2. And this is the height of the midpoint, and this is the, the width, the, the left and right location, and the vertical locations of that midpoint. So the coordinates are x1 plus x2 over 2, comma, y1 plus y2 over 2. That's the coordinate pair for the midpoint uh, of the line segment that connects any two points. Okay, not so bad. Okay, so we've we've graphed a few things. We've talked about coordinates. We've talked about the coordinate plane. It's time to really get down to business, right? It's time to really start talking about how do you graph a function or how do you graph an equation? Well, an equation just tells you a relationship, right? It tells you the rule for connecting two numbers, two real numbers. And the rule we can illustrate using a table. So let's say you're given just some, some uh, uh, rule. So let's say y is 3x plus 1. This is an equation with two variables now. Two variables because whatever this is corresponds to one of the real number lines that we worked with before. And this variable corresponds to the other real line that we were working with. And we usually use x and y for our variables because we usually have an x-axis and a y-axis. So this equation here tells us the rule for connecting two points in an ordered pair. Right? So our goal is to find all of those points, x, comma, y, that belong in this graph, that belong in the plane, that also are solutions to this equation. That's our goal. That is what the graph is. It is the set of all solutions to the rule, which in our case is y equals 3x plus 1. So since we're going to be finding x and y pairs, let's make a table. And I'm just going to start picking a few x's, right? I'm going to sort of look for uh, look for some of the pairs by just picking some x values. So I'm going to go with negative negative 10 seems a little big right now. Negative 3, I'm going to go with 0, and I'm going to go with um, 2. If these are my x ones, my x coordinates, I'm wondering what the y coordinate should be. What y value is paired with them? And the way to find that out is to plug these things in to the formula that we're given for y. Because this is y. That's what this says right there. So when I plug in negative 3, I get negative 9 plus 1, so negative 8. When I plug in 0, I get just 1. When I plug in 2, I get 6 plus 1 is 7. So here we go. Negative 3, 1, 2, 3, negative 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Here's this first point. That's the coordinate pair. Negative 3, negative 8. The next coordinate I found was 0, 1. So 0, 1. The next coordinate pair I found was 2, 7. 1, 2, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. Now, as smoothly and as straightly as possible, I'm going to connect these points. And I think I've got it. So this red line that I've drawn is me sort of extrapolating or interpolating, it means making a good guess, at what the other coordinates should be. So I've, I've found by hand, investigatively, 
what the y coordinate is for a given x coordinate. That's what this was. I picked some x's and I used the formula to tell me what the y coordinate should be. Then I plotted those points. One, two, three of them. If I want a better graph, a more accurate graph, I just need to pick more points, pick more x's, and find more y's. Okay. Then what I did was as smoothly as possible, as, as nicely as I can, is connect those dots, if you will. This is the general process for graphing something that you don't know anything about. Now I know this is a line, so I know that this is actually exactly right. It has some properties that we might be talking about here in a few sections, but for now, I know this is exactly right. Um, let me talk to you real quick about some properties, or some, some vocabulary rather, for graphs. So this is my coordinates, or this is my uh, uh, axis pair, and this is my graph. So we've got an x-axis and we've got a y-axis, and this is our this is our graph in red. Okay, and it'll keep going and it'll keep going here. I want to talk to you about something called an x-intercept. And a y-intercept. First an x-intercept. The word intercept means to come into contact with, to to uh, to inter to find the path of, to come in line with something. So when the x-axis intercepts the graph, when they when they coincide at the same location, we call that an x-intercept. So it's where the graph, where graph and x-axis coincide where they are at the same place. I'm going to highlight them here. I see one x-intercept, two x-intercepts, three, four, five x-intercepts. A little bit earlier I described what these coordinate pairs look like. We'll call this one x1, the y coordinate is 0. We'll call this one x2, comma 0. The next one x3, comma 0. The next one x4, comma 0. And the next one x5, comma 0. I don't know what these numbers are because I didn't pick a uh, a, a nice well-known function. I just sort of randomly drew something there, but those exact locations where it crosses correspond to the five points that I've listed the coordinates of here. You can just replace x1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 with the real numbers that it does actually have, but I don't know them right now. Now the next one is the y-intercept, and this one is defined the exact same way. It, the y-intercept is where the graph and the y-axis coincide. So here, highlighted for you in a different color. It's right there. That point is the y-intercept. There's only one this time. And it has the coordinate pair 0, y1, whatever that is. The x-coordinate is always 0 for the y-intercepts. For the x-intercepts, the y-coordinate is always 0. These are just facts. OK. Now, <clears throat> the next one that we're, we're working on, the next thing that we're going to look at is a bit of a more difficult, uh, a difficult problem. And it's the graph of a circle. OK. Now, the graph of a circle. Uh, you know, you can plainly draw it. You know, as as, as easy as that, but uh, it it is always related to um, a rule 
of this form. Okay, the graph of the circle has a rule of this form. It is x sometimes minus a number or plus a number squared. And this should look like a quadratic right now. Plus y minus sometimes minus a number or plus a number squared. So we see this is like a quadratic plus another quadratic. One of them's in x and one of them's in y. Equal to some number squared. Now if we remember the sort of the anatomy of a circle, a circle has a center. And it has a radius. The radius is the distance from the center of the circle out. Now, built into this form, this rule, which is the sum of two quadratics, one in x, one in y, equaling a constant, the anatomy of the circle is built right in there. The center is the point at the coordinate h, k. So if your circle has an equation x squared plus y squared, right? there's nothing subtracted off, nothing added to the x or the y, then your center is just 0, 0. But if there are numbers subtracted off of the x, or added to the x, or added to the y, or subtracted from the y, the center is at the coordinate h comma k, if you can put it in this exact form. Okay. The radius is right there. It's the square root of whatever constant is on the right side there. So oftentimes you'll see equations like this. So you'll see like x plus 1 squared plus y minus 2 squared equals 36. Right? This is not exactly the same form. First off, this is not a subtraction sign. So let's just make it 1. x minus negative 1 squared plus y minus 2 squared. Well, and that's not something squared, right? That's just a number. So uh, mm, square root of 36, which is 6. Okay. Oftentimes you'll be given the equation of a circle in some form like this that doesn't quite match the exact form we had above here. And you need to determine what the values are. So this is the equation of the circle with center negative 1. 2 and radius 6. So once you do that, once you determine um, what the radius is and what the center is, the graph of the circle is, is really quite simple. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, this circle has a center at negative 1, 2. There's the center. It has a radius of 6. So let's just go down from that point, 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Let's go to the right and to the left, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's a little big, 5, 6. So our circle, even though the, the axes aren't quite on the right scale, I'm, I'm being pretty inaccurate here, the circle connects these points. And then it goes up and above to the one point that is 6 above this one. Okay, Plot the center, <clears throat> go the radius distance out to the left, to the right, above and below, draw a circle as best you can. Maybe I'll <clears throat> draw one where we've got a radius of just 2. So this would look like 
equals 4, right? So I would go 2 to the right, 1, 2, 2 down, 1, 2, 2 left, 1, 2, and 2 up, 1, 2, and then I would just try and connect these points as well as I can, and that's going to, we're going to have to call it a day on that. <laughs> that's about as good as I can do it. Okay. All right. Now there's one more thing left for this section. I know this is a bit longer of a, of a section, but I want to talk about something called symmetry in graphs. Okay, symmetry in graphs. We all know what symmetry is, I think. Um, we all have looked at you know, circles and squares and, uh, and real things like, um, like flowers, right? Or like ferns, fern leaves, or leaves just in general, or even people, just a face, right? Uh, all of these things have very natural symmetries in, built into them, right? There's, there's reflection symmetries if you reflect across a line. There's rotational symmetry if you just put your finger somewhere and spin the thing. Um, there's all kinds of symmetry. And what I mean is, again, is symmetry means that if you make a certain change, you arrive at the exact same thing. So some mathematical symmetries um, would be a symmetry with respect to, okay, and I'm gonna give you three things here. The x-axis. So what I mean by this is, if you replace every y coordinate with the negative, it's the opposite, the graph is still the same. If you replace every y coordinate with the opposite of the y coordinate and the graph is the same, you have symmetry with respect to the x axis. So here's a nice graph. It's basically, the example from the book. I tried to draw it as best as I could. But this has some y coordinate, right? It has some height above the y axis. If I just keep the x, -ax x coordinate the same, and draw a point at the exact same height but below the x-axis. If I can do that for every point and get the exact same graph, right? In other words, if I can spin this thing around the x-axis, if I get the exact same graph, we've got axis, we've got uh, symmetry with respect to the x-axis. Again, it's replacing every y with the negative y. That's that's symmetry with respect to the x-axis. With respect to the y-axis, it's the same idea. Uh, but we're just going to uh, switch every x with negative x, right? And if we still get the same graph, we've got symmetry with respect to the x-axis. So let me take this graph. It's a parabola. If I take a point here on the right, you know, it's got some x coordinate, so this distance is this distance is some value. If I keep the height the same, but I just plot the point the same distance to the left of the y axis, so I'm replacing this x with the negative x. If I do that for every single point along here, and I get the exact same graph, we have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Another way to think about it is, you can just sort of twist the graph by the y-axis. If you can flip it ac across the y-axis, you have this symmetry. Okay. The next one is this, with respect to the origin. Dot, 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 with respect to the origin. origin. Okay. Now I'm going to plot an example here first. This one's a little trickier.
so this is an example of something that has symmetry with respect to the origin. So if I take a point here, it has some x coordinate and some y coordinate. If the same point with the negatives of those, if the same point except with the negatives of those is always on the graph too. So if I pick a random point, any point, and the negative coordinates point is also on the graph. If that's true for every single point that I pick, we say that a graph has symmetry with respect to the origin. Another way of seeing that from a graph is to take this point, right, the origin, and just rotate everything halfway around. If the graph is unchanged, you have symmetry with respect to the origin. Okay, so I I graphically gave you a few examples here and you know some showed you what happens with these symmetries. But the way to really check these things is to do is to do the things that I wrote here. You know, in the rule, in the equation for the thing, replace every y with a negative y. And if the equation is not changed, you've got x-axis symmetry. If you change every x to a negative x, and you get the exact same equation after simplifying, then your graph is going to be the same. For example, y equals x squared. If I switch the x to a negative x and then simplify, well, negative x times negative x is just x squared. If I simplify after changing that and I see the exact same thing that I started with, well, then I know that this thing has that type of symmetry. Uh, similarly here, if I take every y and every x, let me take this example, y equals 2x. If I take all of them and switch their signs, and then simplify, you can divide both sides by negative 1. If I can simplify that and get the exact same thing that I started with before switching them, then I know that graph has a symmetry with respect to the origin. So these are the tests for determining them, the, the, the formulaic way of testing, not just the graphical way of testing them. So I know this was a bit of a longer lecture. There was just a lot of material to cover. Sorry for that, but uh, I hope it was well understood. Um, but that's it for this one. We talked about graphs. We talked about the coordinate plane. We talked about symmetries. Um, and we talked about circles. I forgot about them. Uh, but I hope that helps. I hope that uh, was well understood. And I will see you next time.